Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Open Aquila Case Studies at Open Aperio 2020. Um, we have four presenters today. First, we have Chris Beach, a software developer from Uticon. Chris is currently involved in the support and development of open source software, including Open Aquila, uPortal, and Fizon. Chris sits on the Open Aquila Advisory Board, Open Aquila Security Group, and is a uPortal committer. He was previously a senior support analyst for Aquila at Pearson, where he was involved with the hosting and hosting support and escalated client support of Aquila. Mm -hmm. Next, we have um, excuse me, uh, Kim Palencia. She is the information analyst at Quinnipiac University's Information Technology Department. In addition to providing user application and technology support administering the university's EHR, she also administers the Open Aquila system. Kimberly holds a Master's of Science in Interactive Media and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Quinnipiac University. We also have Matt Miles from BYU Idaho. He's worked at the McKay Library for 24 years. Prior to that, he worked as a software trainer and support tech at Circe Dynix. And he gets to enjoy all the amazing recreational opportunities available in Southeast Idaho. Color me jealous. And finally, we have uh, Mary Glenn. And Mary, I am blanking on, <laughs> I can't find your bio. <laughs> Perhaps you could introduce yourself. Oh, here we go. She's a member of the Information Services at Quinnipiac University as well, and has worked with Open Aquila for nine years. All right, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about content management strategies, why you might want one, uh, and how Open Aquella could be a possible solution to, um, to those strategies. And we're going to keep the bulk of the time to look at some case studies from BYUI and Quinnipiac. Uh, this is important to, you know, really to see what the adopters of the application, you know, how they have chosen to leverage that solution. Um, to fulfill those strategies. And then um, if there's questions, please post them in the chat. And if we don't get to them in line, um, we will we'll hopefully have some time at the end to follow up on them. Next slide. All right, so we already um, had the introduction. So just a little, uh, some headshots of us. Next slide, please. All right, so nearly all institutions have content. Right, uh, it's no surprise, um, but sometimes the management of that content is not well thought out. Uh, management of the content that you have is generally a factor for your success. If you can't get your content to your students, then they're not going to learn as well. If your teachers are duplicating content, the low quality content, um, and there's lots of different reasons why it might be a factor for your success, but generally it is a factor. When we're looking at the um, your content strategy, there's a lot of different factors inside of that, you know, that strategic vision. Are you going to go commercial versus open source? If you're on the call, you're likely looking at open source or considering it. Um, what support model do you want? Do you want to become a power user of your content management system or do you want to have, um, you know, a commercial services provider to help you um, with, you know, with support issues? How do you want to host the thing? Do you want to do everything on-prem? Does it need to be in a specific region? Um, you know, is it a, you know, do you have to go SaaS? Uh, those kind of questions. How are you going to author your content? Do you want to, do you need to use something specific? Um, or is it just, you know, teacher choice on how they choose to author content and then your content management system is more general. Do you want to author everything in the cloud so you can do web based editing and not have to worry about compatibility issues. You, know, you got to think about those kind of things. In terms of moderation and curation. How do you make sure that you have quality content and when you expose that content out to the world, possibly through OER. How do you make sure that it's appropriate to do so. In terms of security, how are you going to make sure that your users are going to be able to access the correct content um, and be able to have the correct actions around that, right? Not everyone should be able to edit certain content. In terms of delivery, that kind of goes with integration. Um, 
what what delivery channels do you have right are you going to need to create pamphlets with this thing uh, with your content is it all digital is it a mixture uh, do you have lmss that need to integrate and um, present or to uh, kind of show your content do you need to have it in your portal or dashboard uh, lots of different you know kind of the sky's the limit on terms of integration but it's going to be specific for your um, for your institution and then when you look at the factors of how you actually store the content, are you looking to do component-based content management or more of a monolithic content management? Uh, you know, you go more towards the component-based and uh, you're able to do a higher level of reuse and remixing, but monolithic content is generally easier for users to kind of wrap their head around um, and, and you don't maybe need as complex of a system. Next slide, please. And so here, we're here to today to talk about Open Aquila, which is a solution to you know, the content strategy considerations that we were just discussing. Um, it is a mature offering. It's only been in the Aperio arena for about three years, but it's been a player in the content management area for about 18 years. It started with the Department of Education in Tasmania and, um, and has just kind of grown through there. Uh, you can host it on premises or through a commercial service provider. It's not really a SaaS application. It can be multi-tenant, but it's really, um, there isn't a single uh, like hosting provider that does SaaS at this point. Uh, so in terms of those commercial service providers, if you want support, you're, you like Open Aquila, but you're not a power user of it, at least yet, uh, there are commercial services providers available globally. Uh, it's geared towards education, right? I mean, that's kind of why we're here, uh, but you can leverage it in a variety of ways and it doesn't have to be for only educational material. Um, I'm gonna skip down to the last one. It's, you can use Open Aquila in a headless mode. So if you wanted to back your, um, I don't know, your Xerdi content object store or your uPortal content, uh, inside of Open Aquila to get all of the content management features, but you really don't want your users to see Open Aquila because you want that seamless um, experience, then you're able to do that. And you can also use the native UX inside of Open Aquila. Uh, one of the big things to take away from Open Aquila, and as you'll see in the uh, in the two case studies is that it's it's deeply configurable and you can customize it to no end. It uses JavaScript with backing Java objects at various connection points in the um, in the content lifecycle, and you can do some pretty phenomenal things with it. Next uh, next slide. And so we're going to now turn it over to BYU, Matt Miles at BYU Idaho uh, to talk about how he has um, worked with his team to leverage Open Aquila. Thanks, Chris. So we have the impossible task today of making content management not boring. So Open Equella, I call it the Swiss Army knife of content management because you can do so many different things with it. Uh, in the short amount of time, I'm only going to be able to show you a few case studies, but I'd be glad to talk to anyone uh, offline uh, about the other case studies and any other questions you might have. So one of the problems that we have, and I think many institutions have, is that we have uh, content in all these disparate locations. And so uh, what we wanted to do is find a, find a content management system where we could house as much content as possible. And then the second part was, we wanted to make this content available through a single search. The other problem is that we didn't have any institutional control over our assets. And any of you that work with faculty know that it's very difficult to, to get them to do uh, anything that they don't really want to do. They have their, their content in all different kinds of places. And then digital rights management, when you license content, uh, when does it expire? When does it need to be renewed? And who should be able to see the content? You know, we have a lot of people that say, well, I can just put this up on a web server, but we didn't have any, ins you have very little institutional control when people do that, or if they put it in box or uh, something like that. So I kind of summarize it, uh, Equella, we use it, by using it, you can find your stuff, you can have institutional control over your stuff, 
you can repurpose your stuff and you can provide context because there's metadata around your objects. So when you implement a new system, it's pretty tough to do without an executive champion. Uh, you have to convince people or show them that you have something that they want, especially in content management, because people all have their own little way of doing things. You need to recruit a team that can provide training. Uh, I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one training with faculty that were interested, and we did a soft launch grassroots bottom-up approach. When you come in and say, hey, here's our content management system and you will use it, it usually breeds contempt. So you want to find those people that want to be involved and then you use them to promote the product. So if I can get some faculty members to use the product and they, they, they like the process, they see the value, they will do the recruitment and they will promote the product for you. And last of all, uh, after you're willing to train one on one to go to the offices of the different people and understand their content management needs to provide them a customized solution, prepare to be despised because whenever you bring a new system online, there, there's always uh, resistance. And so you just have to be able to take what I call taking the hits, work with people who are upset, uh, maybe send them a fruit basket here and there. So one of the use cases I wanted to share with you is our special collections and archives. Many libraries have uh, special collections and archives, but they have a difficult time exposing that content to their users. So this is one project that we took on called the Alumni Obituaries. The Alumni Office had basically paper clippings of thousands of uh, alumni obituaries uh, sitting in, in a shoebox. So what we did is we took these objects, we digitized them, we OCR the text, and then we made them available in Equella. Second thing we did, uh, we had all of these uh, interviews. Uh, if any of you know much about the area, there was a, there was a dam on the Teton River that broke in 19, it was in the, I think 74, wiped out the town. Uh, these are interviews of people that were here at the time. We have the transcripts along with the audio. And we have other uh, objects that we digitize, photographs, um, papers, and, uh, and other objects. So for example, we have these cuneiform um, objects. We also have a page of the Gutenberg Bible. We have a number of uh, artifacts. And so we've digitized these so that people can look at them without actually having to come into the library. Here's an example of uh, oral history. Uh, this lady actually lives, lived in my neighborhood. She passed away recently. But you can see that there's a transcript of her interview along with the MP3 files that you can listen to. And this kind of, uh, this shows also that there's, a, we have Kaltura. There's Kaltura integration with Equella. So when you click on those links, it'll bring up the actual audio and play the interview. So going back to what I talked about in the, in the beginning, we wanted to then unify our content through a single search. And so many libraries have a meta search tool. We use uh, uh, EBSCO's EDS. Uh, and so you could search our library catalog for Hetty Brown interview, and it would, it would bring you to this page. And you can see where once you click on the item, there's the link to Equella, and you launch it, and it brings you to the Equella item. So people can find things without saying, well, which content system do I have to go to? Do I have to go to the special collections page? No, you do not. OK, so I wanted to talk about faculty created content. Here's an example, uh, chemistry lectures for 220. Equella is particularly helpful when you have content that's used across a number of courses, instead of having each faculty member have a copy of the content in their course, you have a single copy and you link to this within your course management system so that there's one, one object for the entire, uh, for the course and for all of its sections. So you don't have to worry about all these different versions out there. Here's another example, Brian Feld, he's, he's very forward thinking. He, uh, he's in our, uh, teaches Russian and he organizes the content uh, for all the sections. 
So he uses Equella to put the content as, uh, in, and within Equella, you can create little web pages. And so here's an example of a web page that he created for his Russian class. And within the web page, you can see that there are links here to other pieces of content, which are also in Equella. And these are used for all the classes. Faculty will typically add their own little, you know, they'll augment the core content of the course with their own things, which is fine. But the core content is the same for all the courses. It's updated in one place. Uh, our anatomy and physiology people uh, had a problem where they had created these uh, HTML5 little learning objects that, that were basically just uh, JavaScript, HTML5, you know, CSS. And they were on a web server, but the problem was is that the web server did not uh, allow them the flexibility to give access to the people that needed the object. They couldn't just make it public because the images were copyright, had copyright on them. So you can actually load up these objects into Equella, and Equella will act just like a kind of a fancy web server. So here's the Skull Lab, and here's what it looks like. You don't even know, the students don't even know they're in Equella. All they see is this Skull, interactive Skull Lab. Well, that's uh, my presentation. As I mentioned, I'd be glad to talk to any of you about other use cases. Uh, just uh, there's my contact information, and I look forward to talking to you in the future. One thing I forgot to mention is I noticed that Inga was, uh, is uh, watching from Xerti. We have Xerti objects also hosted in Equella. It works quite nicely for that. So with that, I'll turn it over to my friends in Connecticut. Take it away. Great. Good morning. Um, thank you to um, Jen, Chris, and Matt for all the good information. Um, I'm Mary Glenn, and I work in information services at Quinnipiac. I've been working with Open Equello for the past nine years. We've used it extensively, and like Matt, we have several collections on campus. And to Chris's point, it's helped greatly with our content strategy. I work alongside Kim Palencia, who also works in information services and who has created a number of collections using the Open Quella's built-in features, and we will review some of them in a few, few minutes. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we have many collections with, within Open Equella, and if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, However, we're planning to concentrate on one specific collection named Faculty Activities. We will describe the collection in detail and provide screenshots highlighting several open and quality feature, features, including customized data screens, CSS branding, conditional fields, and much more. In addition, we will briefly describe roles. As Matt mentioned, in order for the project to be successful, you need, to buy, you need the buy-in and support from your stakeholders. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sure we can all relate. Our data is stored in files, folders, thumb drives, laptops, and on the cloud. And when we need it, we have to go looking for it. Ideally, it would be great to store the data in one place. The faculty activities collection was created with that in mind. Today, faculty data is collected and stored in Open Equella. Next slide, please. Open Equella is a centralized repository. You can easily customize data entry screens, grant permissions at several levels, collect attachments and provide workflow. With Open Equella as our repository, we collect faculty data and it can be reused for other purposes. Our motto, and if we go to the next slide please, is to collect once and reuse. Open Equella stores faculty data and it is repurposed for accreditation reports, our university directory, work plans, searching, and collaboration. By entering data into one system, faculty are not required to enter the same information multiple times. Today, we will show you how we collect faculty data and reuse it. Next slide, please. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have two collections, including faculty demographics and faculty activities. Demographics includes the longitudinal data, like work experience, expertise, biography, and social media. 
In addition, we collect scholarships, service, honors, and awards on a yearly annual basis. Kim will show you how we collect the data in Open Aquella. Thank you, Mary. Next slide, please. I'm gonna start by showing how we collect that faculty demographics. What you see here is our Open Aquella form. I like to call it a uh, super form because of all the abilities you have to build the form. You can add multiple pages to it, drop downs, attachments, buttons, and much more. And they can all be permissioned in countless ways. The customization is truly endless. So faculty enter historical faculty data, such as experiences, expertise, social media, a biography, using the form as shown here on the right. These are some of the fields they enter. Um, and for example, this is where they enter experience. Note this checkbox at the bottom of the form where it says, do not display in the directory. That's gonna come into play in just a little bit. Next slide, please. Once the form is submitted, this is the summary and display page. So combining the data, some programming and design elements, we created an enhanced design that allows for users to easily see the data that they entered in the form on this summary display page. And so if you remember that little checkbox I told you remember, this is where it comes into play. The red eye icon shows if they selected that checkbox, that would indicate that this section will not display on the directory page. So not only do we have the ability to customize the form when we're creating it, but the form has now empowered the user to as well. And that mini icon, the mini Q icon that you see is our actually our university logo. We made that into an icon and that is used to let the user know which section will appear on the online profile. Next slide, please. The other area that we collect is annual faculty activities. Faculty update this yearly. So we have this up-to-date data and we collect these four categories, scholarship, service, professional development, and awards. Similar to the other display page I showed you, this display page also has been designed for a better user experience. For example, we use tabs across the top of the display so that users can see their data in a concise manner. Links to resources and attachments collected are also displayed. And once again, we use icons to remind the faculty what will display and what won't display on reports that we pull or the public directory based on their choices within the form. So now let's take a peek of what the form behind this display looks like. Next slide, please. So this is the form that the user fills out. As you can see, a lot of data is, um, can be collected. To show you on just one screen, I put the form side by side instead of um, lengthwise. The form has many different features that allow for us to collect various types of data. So for this example, we're collecting intellectual contributions, um, also known as publications from the faculty. So depending on the type that they select, different fields will appear. So for example, if books are selected, a set of fields for books appear. If a chapter is selected as a type, it may contain other types of fields for um, chapters. So all this data is collected using Open Aquella, and it serves a magnitude of purposes. And my colleague, Mary, will now show you what we did with this data. Mary, take it away. Thank you, Kim. So just wanted to um, tell you a little bit more. We host Open Aquella on site, and we have access to the data source, and we can share the data with other systems. As an example, we provide a daily extract for our public directory. The data is exported and reused on our website. You can see we have our um, boomer over to the right on the screen. And as you notice, it has a different look and feel. The best part is that faculty do not have to enter the same data into two separate tools. Next slide, please. Kim and I support Open Aquella and we rely on others to keep the collection current. Stakeholders, and as Matt mentioned, executive champions are key in the process. We work closely with deans, faculty, and support staff. Deans handle the communications with faculty and the motivation for collecting and entering the data. We also partner with academic technology. We work on creating and defining the collections and AT provides support and documentation. In addition, we partner with other departments on campus. 
Open Aquila has provided a robust solution for Quinnipiac, and we hope the demo provided some insight. We definitely appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, folks. It's always interesting to see what people have been able to come up with um, using Open Aquila. If this is interesting to you folks, please consider getting involved. We have the, you know, the standard Aperio website for the application, uh, our GitHub issues tracker. If you're using Open Aquila and you, you want to uh, suggest a feature or a, um, a bug report, uh, we have our Google groups that are the, the most active way to get a hold of people. Uh, and then if you're interested in what have other people created with Open Aquila and wanted to share out, you know, some script they're excited to share or some report, uh, there's a community artifact site. Um, if you are looking to get interested in uh, developing Open Aquila, right, uh, and you want to join that community, uh, we have monthly community developer meetings that are very active. Uh, we generally fill the entire hour uh, and just we get the, the developers that are working on the code right now um, on a call and talking about uh, what they're working on and, um, and future efforts. So with that next slide, please. We'll take any questions if there are some. Hi there, can I uh, pop a question? Please. Um, I missed probably the first five minutes, but um, definitely very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, as a newbie to Open Aquila, I probably would like to just ask if this integrates to the LMS, is it possible to point to a resource um, in Open Aquila from the LMS so the student can actually view it still within the LMS, but it sits in one place in Open Aquila. Yes, you can. So it, yeah. it handles LTI integrations. There's standard LMS integrations where it kind of goes both ways with like the REST AP, Open Aquila talking to the REST API of the LMS. And you can also do uh, kind of generic LTI integrations, which it will work. It just may not be as integrated as, um, as the other um, standard integrations. Okay, super, thank you. If I could just add to that here at BYU Idaho, we, we, uh, we use it quite a bit for this. Um, personally, I, I, I teach one co course. Uh, I just do simple links within the, the course management system. We use Canvas uh, because when users are say on a mobile device, you can embed the content right within uh, the course management system, but personally, I don't do it that way because Equella is actually delivers more quickly than the course management system does. Um, and so I just have a link and I have, it opens up my documents outside of the course management system in a new window. However, you can embed the, embed the objects right inside of the course management system. If you just have the, uh, if you're just putting the links in there, um, and obviously the, the course materials in Canvas are visible only by students that are enrolled in the course, but that link that you're giving to Aquella, um, is that link accessible? I mean, if anybody had that link, could they get access to the materials or does Aquella also know who is enrolled in a course and only um, delivers the resource to that student? That's a good question. So our Equella, uh, we don't, I mean, we could, there's, there's, you can uh, integrate Equella with LDAP or something else. So if you have those courses uh, set up in your security, you could, we don't do it that way. We just, they, ha they have to have a, uh, campus account. So uh, we have single sign on uh, set up with our Equella. So if they're already logged into the course, they'll get to the content. But it's not locked down to the point that uh, only the people in that course could see it. Now, some faculty, what they do is when, when you create a contribution in Equella with objects, 
uh, you can define whether or not that object is findable within searching in Equella. And what they do is some people say, I don't want it, I want, to, I want the URL to be unpublished. And so that's how they handle that if they don't want people outside of the class to get to it. So our, our authentication is fairly simple in terms of the Equella objects. Most of them, they're either, you have access if you have a, a campus account or you don't. At, or we make like our special collections, all those items are made public, so you don't you don't have to log in to see them. But you could do you could do a lot more granular security if you wanted to. We just don't do it because uh, most you can't, you know, students aren't going to go to find Equella, search for an object. I mean, they're really not that interested in finding other faculty's content. Um, so that's how we do it. Thank you. If there's no other questions, we're at the end of our session time. Um, but if there are other questions, please speak up. If I could just add one more thing, we have a very large online presence. Um, where we have uh, uh, an area called pathway where we're providing content to students in, in all parts of the world that aren't necessarily leading to a four-year degree. They're to provide people in places like Nigeria or uh, you know, Fiji, their, their, their courses that will allow them to raise their standard of living with, with, a, with, a, you know, with a six month training or a year training and we're delivering these objects through Open Equella because it's it's uh, we're using uh, Unicon to host it. Well, it's hosted in the Amazon cloud, and so uh, we're able to deliver these objects to all kinds of remote places. So, if you're in that situation where you're delivering to 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 uh, locations that are more remote, then I would suggest you know hosting with Unicon. Is the pathways something that um, those on the call could reference? Is there perhaps a URL you could put in the chat? Yeah, let me let me see if I can find that. And I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Great, thanks, Matt. Just wanted to get that captured in the chat before we end the session. Well, thank you to all of our speakers. We appreciate the time and effort that you went to to put this information together. Thank you. Right. Take thank care, you, folks. Thank you.